It's time for our responsive reading. This is a weekly practice that we do together here at Beacon Church to uh, consider and confess together the scriptural truths that unite us as believers in Jesus Christ and followers of him. Last week, we, uh, we spoke about what the Ten Commandments are, uh, what God's moral law is, and in the coming weeks now, we're looking uh, in more detail at the individual commandments. This week, our question is, what does God require in the first, second, and third commandments? I'll read these commandments in Exodus 20, and then we'll take a closer look. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. So first, uh, God introduces these commandments by identifying himself. He identifies himself as the God who brought Israel out of the land of Egypt. So for these Israelites, there was no question about Who's speaking to us? Who is this God? Who's requiring these laws? Whose law are we receiving? They witnessed God's actions, his acts. They witnessed his mercy in bringing them out of Egypt while they were in the land of Egypt. They saw him send hailstones. They saw him wipe out cattle. They saw him bring in these great swarms of of gnats and um, and, and they they saw his... his, uh, tremendous mercy on passing over them by giving them uh, the means of the Passover to spread the blood on their doorpost that their firstborn sons would not be killed uh, along with the others. So the Israelites know who God is here. The first command that he gives to them is that they should have no God before the one true God, no God other than the one true God. And they know who that true God is because they witness his acts in Egypt, like I just described. This means that of all that could be served and worshipped in this world, and uh, trust me, people have tried to serve and worship almost everything in this world, Israel must only, God's people must only worship the true and living God. Of all that could be desired or considered important, God is to be first. Uh, And for us, uh, in these last days, the same God who continued, um, who revealed himself to Israel is the same God who has continued to reveal himself to us through his son, Jesus Christ. So we know who God is, and we know how he's commanded us to worship him and serve him. The second commandment is not to make a carved image or likeness of anything to be served and bowed down to. We call this idolatry. In Exodus 33, Moses says to God, please show me your glory. And God says, I will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. But he said, you cannot see my face for man shall not see me and live. And the Lord said, behold, there is a place by me where you shall stand on the rock And while my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. It is clear in these verses that the holiness and glory of God is more than we can bear as humans. We bow before God because we have no choice when confronted with his holiness and glory. One day, everybody will face God's holiness and bow, either as humble servants or as subdued enemies. Anything we could possibly imagine or create with our own minds and hands is not worthy of our worship and wouldn't have the same effect on us. Nobody creates um, a, a golden calf or some other statue and is overwhelmed by the glory of that thing. That has never happened. 
But when people are faced with God and his holiness, we see examples of this in the Bible. They are overwhelmed and they bow and they fall on their faces. In Exodus 32, Israel was tired of waiting for Moses on the mountain where he was receiving instruction from the true God. So they ask Aaron to create a new God worth following. Aaron comes up with the best thing he can think of. He melts down their gold earrings and fashions a calf, saying, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt, and they built an altar and offer sacrifices to the golden calf. That was a lie. Israel knew who brought them out of the land of Egypt. It was not this calf. It was the God who re revealed himself through Moses and through his actions. There is no way that it was that golden calf that Aaron created that brought them out of the land of Egypt. So we know who God is by his acts, the way he, he has revealed himself to us, and we do not know him by anything that we create. It is only God who reveals himself to us. We worship that God. The third command is to not take the name of the Lord in vain. The word vain here means worthless or meaningless. Taking the Lord's name in vain then would be to associate God and his name with that which is worthless or meaningless. And there are many examples of this in scripture. Leviticus 24, 16 says that blaspheming the name of the Lord is punishable by death. Making a false oath upon God's name is also taking his name in vain, according to Leviticus 19, 12. When somebody says, I will be there, or they make some other promise, and they say, I swear to God, and then they break that promise, as we are so prone to do as humans, they take the name of God, the name of Yahweh, and they attach it to something worthless. They attach it to their worthless and meaningless promise. Jeremiah 23, verse 25, also says that false prophecy is an example of taking the Lord's name in vain by associating God's name with the lies of men. And our purpose as God's creatures, God created us to bring him glory. So when we attach the glory of God, we attach his name to something worthless, that's contrary to our very nature. That's contrary to the very thing that God created us for. So at this point, I would like to invite you to stand and join me. I'll read the question, and I invite you to join me in responding. What does God require in the first, second, and third commandments? First, that we know and trust God as the only true and living God. Second, that we avoid all idolatry and do not worship God improperly. Third, that we treat God's name with fear and reverence, honoring also his word and works. Let's pray. Lord, great are you and greatly to be praised. Lord, forgive us when we place other things ahead of you in our lives. Lord, forgive us when we attach your name and your glory to worthless or meaningless things. Lord, the law shows us, if we take the, your law and your word seriously, it shows our need. Lord, I thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ, who was perfect, who was holy. Lord, we, we sang in a song, um, two wonders here that I confess, my worth and my unworthiness. Lord, that worth in your eyes is the worth of your son. We are clothed in the goodness and the perfection of your son, Jesus Christ, and we praise you for that. Lord, all the ways that we profane your name, we thank you that your son died um, to take the punishment for those actions, those words, those thoughts. And Lord, we thank you that his perfect holiness and righteousness has been attributed to us, Lord, that it clothes your people, all who believe and trust in Jesus Christ for the salvation of their sins. We praise you for that. Amen. We're going to take a five-minute break.